accepting on Friday, closing on Friday, next Thursday. Well, actually, from what I understand, the conference chart is Austin, yep. we're under U-Drive. Uh, U-Drive, uh, planning and junior development. There should be a folder that says Average bundle. Yeah, exactly. I believe I I really don't know. I should never know. Oh, it hurt. Your name is Oh, yeah. You have killed me. I guess I could think I Walk in the door and Rich was handed to me. <laughs> Take him for a walk. <laughs> I don't really like him all. All right. That's good. Good for Buck Putin. Yeah, he finally asked you more. Right. Okay. And say the uh, best. That's great pose. Great pose. Yep. You know, I thought we had our done. Mm -hmm. So it's I already the live permit, right? Yeah. That's why I it all up. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Father, we thank you for your goodness, love, and your blessings that you bestow upon us. Lift our eyes to seek you first today. We thank you for your mercy and grace each day. We pray that you will show your mercy and grace upon the Ukrainian people. We have heard stories over the past week of horrific war and conflict. We pray for you to end this violence and to provide protection for all the innocent victims caught in the middle of this evil. You are the Prince of Peace. May your spirit comfort those that fear for tomorrow. We pray for the precious children caught in the war. We've learned that there are as many as 100,000 children that have become orphans in the past few days. We pray as other governments, leaders, businesses, and others rally around Ukraine that the violence will stop and freedom will be respected for all people. Father, we thank you for those who protect us. We celebrate with the Navy Reserve on their birthday. The 100,000 reservists 
Today I've served in every major war that the U.S. has been engaged. Formed in 1915, in response to World War I, they comprise of 84% of the Navy during the war. We thank them on a special day for their service. We also honor the Navy CB, whose birthday is on Saturday. Originated in, 19, originated in World War II in 1942. They have been instrumental in combat operations, humanitarian efforts, and nation building. And we thank them for their dedication and service. As we conduct our meeting, may you grant your wisdom and clarity. May our decisions be in accordance with your will. These things we humbly ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we will convene the Commissioner's public meeting and ask for the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All your side? Aye. 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 So carried at this time we'll have public comments on agenda items only. Hearing that we'll move on to bid openings. I'm on the line. Good morning. Good morning. We just have the bid for the food products and there were three bids submitted. Pico, Caesars, and Cisco and their multi-line item bids. Okay. Thank you, Krista. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to reports. Brandy? Good morning, Commissioners. We're here to ratify the Accounts Payable Cash Requirements Report for invoices due through March 9th, 2022 that were paid on March 2nd, 2022 in the amount of $683,020.75. Of which $154,377.50 were county general funds or 22.6%, $428,217.98 were grants and other sources or 62.69%, $55,368.78 um, were invoices paid by resource management services or 8.11%. And forty-five thousand fifty-six dollars and forty-nine cents were escrow funds. Okay. Any questions? No. Hearing none. Can I have a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. All those mm -hmm. aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. And, uh, Jessica. Morning. Good morning, Commissioners. I am here to seek your approval for the personnel actions for January and February. Um, with my arrival in January, um, I they're a little behind, um, but just wanted to get them updated here, and we'll have them monthly for you moving forward. Okay. So the only question I have is, do we know which of these are new hires, if they, uh, replace not replacements, uh, new positions? You may not know off the top of your head. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. The majority of them are probably replacement. Correct. I would say 98. Maybe there's a way just to asterisk in the future okay. what's a new hire so you don't have to make a new column. Okay. You mean, because well, there's your salary board. Wouldn't that be possibly that would be one of them? Would salary board well, tell us that? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's new. No. Yeah, if it's new. No. Yeah, they'd be promotions too. Yeah. yeah, they could be promotions, but yeah. Maybe but I can certainly can add a column put an to this. Yep, for the I future. I don't know if you have room for a column, but if you don't, it's up to you. I'll make room. Okay, Commissioner, <laughs> I, I don't believe we have any new positions. I just looked. There's no. Yeah, there's there's no. none. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, you can even at the bottom just put asterisk new hire in okay. your position. Okay. You know, whatever you want to do, it's it's up All to right. you. But don't kill yourself trying to make another column. Because okay. it, it rarely happens. Okay, sounds good. Yep. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. All right, you're welcome. I have a motion to accept. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Okay, informational items. Lawson? Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. 
So today I am here uh, with just with an informational item um, to talk about our bridge bundling program. Uh, 2022 is going to be uh, the biggest year for the bridge bundling program and uh, arguably uh, local infrastructure for the county in the long while. So um, the idea of the bridge bundling program goes back about a decade, but we really didn't see um, any movement on it until about 2016 or 2017. Um, we initially identified 42 bridges uh, throughout the county and 21 municipalities um, that met the criteria that we felt would be ideal for the bridge bundling program. So uh, with there being no shortage of bridges across the county that were in need of repair, we began tightening up that list to a group that we felt we could work a project for. So we ended up with 17 bridges in 17 municipalities spread across the county, east to west, north and south. Um, the biggest hurdle, and as is the case with a lot of municipal gov or local government, is how do we pay for it? Uh, so the county um, decided to enact the $5 fee that's permitted through Act 89, um, which allows uh, the county to put a $5 registration fee on any vehicle registration. We took that money and utilized it to leverage a $7 million PIB loan um, through the state, which allowed us to, you know, really take on the bulk of the cost of the program. Um, in enabling or enacting this $5 fee in a timely manner um, also allowed us to leverage two additional bridges that wouldn't have been able to be funded uh, through the bridge bundling program, um, and those are in Pine and Upper Fairfield Townships. Uh, and those bridges would not have been able to be accomplished otherwise. Uh, those bridges um, are being funded and, man and managed either through the state or the federal government, so um, we were excited to get those under our belt as well. Quick, quick question. You said they were Upper Fairfield, and what was the other one? Pine Township. Pine Township. Yeah, I know the Pine Township one specifically was one of the more costly ones that um, we were glad that the state and the feds were able to pick up for us. I was going to say, one of them was, I think, at least a million dollars. It was, I think it was one three. One was three, and, and the other one was what? Uh, I think it was under a million, but it was still pricey Expensive. compared to, yeah, the rest of the ones in, you know, in our, in our bridge bundling program. Right. So, the municipalities also contribute 5% of the estimated cost of their bridge so that they have some skin in the game. Um, for a, a good example of just you know how well the municipalities are, are how much the municipalities are saving on this, so the most expensive of the township payments uh, for five percent was uh, around forty thousand um, dollars. Conversely, the cheapest of any of the replacement bridges was three hundred thousand dollars. So even the most expensive bridge payment was still significantly less than what the replacement would be. Um, at that point in time, the county did a RFP to hire a design engineer, a lead engineer for the program. Um, and at that point in time, we hired uh, Bassett Engineering, and I have Britt Bassett here with me today, um, whose recommendation was that we attack these 17 bridges in four bundles spread over three years, which was a year shorter than our initial estimate. Um, so bundle one, we started last year and we completed that as, uh, last year as well. There were four bridges across the county, uh, Limestone Township, Eldred Township, Muncie Township, and Hepburn Townships. And uh, Matt, if you could go for yep. a couple slides, there's actually pictures of these. Yeah, just when you want, so just okay. slide on there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you want to go forward, um, one more. So two of the bridges that we did, uh, we started out with Limestone Township and uh, finished off with Hepburn Township, which was seen there. Um, and we did a you know groundbreaking for at Limestone Township and a ribbon cutting for Hepburn Township. Uh, but all the partners were involved. So uh, one of the ways that we were innovative with Bundle One was we pre-purchased the aluminum box culverts that were utilized in this. And by doing so, we were able to save $100,000 um, that we would have otherwise had to put into our uh, budget. Um, and then, you know, we went through that process. We hired Wolniak uh, to do the general construction for Bundle 1, and we hired McTish Conklin Associates to do the construction inspection for Bundle 1. And uh, we were extremely pleased with how that turned out. Um, we heard glowing reviews from the municipalities that were involved in Bundle 1. And uh, we we're really excited to get forward, uh, moving forward on bundles two and three this year. So at this point, I'll turn it over to 
uh, Britt to handles, uh, handle what we're going to be taking on this year for bundles 233. Uh, so uh, we do have slides as well. Uh, the other uh, little box we put in, this is uh, uh, Limestone Township Mill Road was the first one done and uh, Moody Road, uh, Muncie Township, which is right parallel to 220. And uh, the next slide, Matt, is, uh, shows us some uh, dirt construction pictures. The first one is uh, Mill Road in Limestone Township. This was had aluminum shell put on concrete footings. We did two of them like this, Caleb's Creek and um, uh, Mill Road. And then the one on the right-hand side is uh, the entire structure of aluminum, including the bottom floor plate. And uh, both uh, uh, Caleb's Creek Road and Oak Moody Road were done in this manner, so uh, it allowed for very rap both rap allowed for very rapid construction. What's the life expectancy of a of a uh, culvert bridge like that, a box culvert? At least 50 years. Yeah. Okay. They're durable. The aluminum doesn't corrode. The you know, obviously a concrete footing, but the put in concrete footings last as any long as any precast concrete, but. Um, the structures are buried, like even the lot aluminum floor plate is buried at least a foot in the creek bottom. Great, excuse me for a second. Could you pull the microphone up a little higher? Because this, this is online. So okay. There you is go. that better? Yep. Speak Thanks. to yep. so okay. Thank you very yep. much. Sure. Great. Um, and then we can go to the next slide, Matt. Um, so talking about uh, bundle two, uh, summary, what we'll be building this year, uh, Walnut Construction got that contract as well. Uh, we're doing three concrete arches and two concrete box culverts. The contract has been awarded and notice proceed has been issued. Um, we are also pre-purchasing those structures as well through CoStars and uh, those structures have been, we've received some shop drawings and they've been submitted to PennDOT for structural, final structural absence approval. Um, and we expect for construction to start in April on two of the sites and uh, Walnick's gearing up for that. Um, re reviewing through the cost history, um, the costs for the county's original request for engineering proposals were based on estimates the engineers had done in doing the bridge inspections, uh, estimated $1.8 million. Uh, cost estimate from our feasibility study was uh, 2.06 to $2.74 million. Um, some escalation uh, because of that, bigger structures, some things changed, and the actual as bid cost uh, Pre-purchase contract seven hundred fifty-four thousand dollars, and the general contract is one million seven hundred seventy-six thousand. So the total is two point five million. So it's still below the upper end of our feasibility study range. Um, you know the reasons for this, uh, the economy, what's going on nowadays, uh, certainly have a factor. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so there's uh, we did a feasibility study that was something that wasn't in the RFP we thought was important to look at options at each site for different structure types. And I wanted to go through some of the reasons why we selected certain types of structures. When we look at using a concrete box culvert, it's an urban situation, a low rise situation where there's not much underclearance between the road surface and the bridge and the creek. Um, higher traffic counts are a factor. So, you know, both Loyal Sock and Jersey Shore had uh, very low rise situations. Loyal Sock has pretty high traffic count. Uh, the beauty of aluminum or concrete box culverts is um, the minimal footprint. It's their smallest, most compact structure. Uh, we're right next to homes in Jersey Shore. There are utility impacts, water line in both uh, Jersey Shore and Loyal Sock, and overhead electric at uh, Jersey Shore. And in both cases, we are connecting two existing structures, so concrete boxes are ideal for that. Um, concrete arches, we've done a number of those uh, here and elsewhere. Um, they're ideal for suburban and rural sites uh, where you have a higher rise, you know, where it's not a low rise, like a, where you need a box, you can make an arch fit. Uh, they're ideal for high stream velocities, RSR concrete box culverts. They are the most cost effective concrete structure. If you can fit a concrete arch and you need a, or want a concrete structure, that's the most cost effective and they're hydraulically efficient. So. Uh, in most cases, we're dramatically increasing the stream flow we can pass during a flood. And I mentioned that, you know, pre-purchase, why, why pre-purchase a structure for co-stars? We feel it has to be a reason. The reason here is we say both time and cost. Pre-purchasing allowed us to move forward about two months earlier than we would have if we hadn't pre-purchased the structures. And, you know, we try to do five structures in one year, it's important. The pictures here, uh, next slide, um, 
So these existing structures are Sheridan Street. Uh, you're looking from the downstream box, which is a rectangular box, into this upstream half arch. And uh, the new box will have the same size as the downstream. So you see a huge increase in flood capacity. And Loyal Sock does flood every few years, that intersection floods. Uh, Wilson Street, Jersey Shore, that was an old stone box, uh, hand laid concrete, um, just structurally deficient, and that'll be replaced there. That. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's right. I think it's important for the public. Slides 9 and 10. How old are those bridges, do you think, looking at them? Loyal Sock, Jersey Shore, Franklin, Susquehanna? Well, uh, they're at least. Um, I'm not sure about Loyal Sock. It might only be 30, 40 years. Um, but we actually did some research on the water lines, and you know, we found that you know, the water line was built around the end of the arch there. So that's at least 40 years. The Jersey Shore, the original structures, you know, I'm not sure when they poured the concrete, but there's been one there for 100 years, some sort of box. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, these. That's been the thing with these municipal projects, is these can things are kept long past their lifetime because right. there's no funding mechanism. You just wait until they're closed, and then, then you find out how to make it work. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and then if we look at the, uh, some of the concrete arch sites. So Franklin Township has this uh, squash pipe uh, uh, structure. Um, this is called hydraulically disconnected when there's a water fault that the tail end of the structure, um, no aquatic organisms, fish, or any aquatic life can pass. So with the concrete arch, we, we allow aquatic organism passage, which is important for the environmental considerations. Valley Road is another uh, pipe, uh, grossly undersized. What you're seeing downstream, this huge hole we call a scour hole, that happens. The water comes out of the pipe like a fire nozzle and scours the bottom of the stream. We'll be fixing that. And uh, then the next is uh, uh, Bill Sones Road, Moreland Township. It's, this is pretty visible. If you ever drive down Route 40, 40, 442, it's right on the right. And this is a, just an old mess of a bridge. It's been fixed up over the years. That's going to go away. And on the right-hand side, there's two examples. The top one is an arch we just built uh, last year in Potter County. And the lo lower one is, is an arch we built about 10 years ago in Brady Township. And uh, you'll see they, they uh, wonderful structures go together pretty quickly. The next slide. So the next group of uh, bridges, we're opening bids. Uh, I guess the bids are due tomorrow. And we're opening next Thursday. This is bundle three. And what we'll be building under bundle three is geosynthetic reinforced soil integrated bridge system bridges. Um, the uh, cost. Did we miss the slide? Oh, yeah, sorry, I skipped it. Um, so the cost of the request for engineering proposals is two, two, just over $2 million. Um, our estimate from the feasibility study was lower, $1.179 to $1.57 million. We'll see with market conditions, you know, well, let's go on the economy. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We're hoping to save some money here, the way we did in bundle one. Um, next slide. So... When we look at GRS bridges, uh, there again are criteria where a GRS bridge is, is the optimum bridge. Uh, rural sites, open sites are ideal. Uh, low stream velocities, in this county that means if you have a headwater stream, something that's up on a plateau area, something in agricultural areas um, fit well. And we have a number of those in the county, but you don't quite realize um, we think it's all hills here. Um, the geometry there, they allow for a low rise. Now, they can't be a high rise, but you can fit a GRS bridge in a low rise situation, same as you can a concrete or aluminum box culvert. Um, unlike uh, the boxes, whether it's aluminum or concrete or the arches, you can build these on a skew. So if the creek is uh, not at a straight 90 degree from the road, <coughs> these abutments you can build any shape you want, literally. Um, you can super elevate the road if the the road is a, on a curve and it's super elevated, which we're doing in Gamble Township. You just super elevate the above it. So there's a lot of advantage to that. Uh, they're very quick to put together. Once a contractor has experience, um, they can put each abutment together in a matter, matter of a couple weeks. So that lends itself to building five bridges this year. 
Um, and they're, that's the thing, they're much faster than cast in place concrete abutments. Uh, we are going to use adjacent beams. All these are going to be adjacent beam bridges. And that, again, speeds the construction of the superstructure itself. Um, and we'll be using structure mounted guide rail. Uh, longevity, you know, everything in here is precast concrete. The blocks themselves are precast. The beams are precast concrete. We'll be using cast in place concrete decks. So these have a, you know, great long lifespan for these bridges. What does that stand for, GRSIBS? That was on the first slide, Geosynthetic Reinforced Soil. And if you look, um, yeah, see that slide there, that uh, third, second line. Okay. And if you look at the photo next to, right here on the right-hand side, you can see what you're seeing is that we put down layers of stone and layers of GH textile on top of stone. And you use angular stone, and when you compact the stone on top of the geotextile, and that's li literally into the fabric. So it doesn't move like when there's a flood. And we do the entire inside and around it is uh, the concrete blocks around the perimeter forming U shape. So they keep the flood waters from getting into the stone, but on top of that, the GRS uh, uh, supports and spreads the load and is able to, you're able to support an uh, entire bridge load deck and vehicles on stone, literally, with that. Because it does not bear the concrete wall, it bears directly on the stone. What about IBS? The integrated bridge system means that the superstructure is integrated with the abutment. And that has to do with the type of superstructure. And you can put any superstructure on. You can use beam, steel beams, concrete beams, um, you know, our case using concrete beams. But the abutment is set up to be integrated. Like the one we did in uh, Clifford Township, that was a steel truss bridge with pedestrian bridge. And we uh, poured a cast-in-place cast concrete foundation to set the steel beam on, steel beam bridge on. So that's the, the important about the integrated. It's, it's integrated with a. Um, now these things they extend six feet below grade, which is pen dot requirement. Uh, so they're just uh, they're rip wrap around the exterior, rent from scour. There's just a lot of it's the integration. There's a lot of aspects that are knitted together to provide a durable structure. Uh, here's the sites we're going to be building, Bundle 300, Winter Lane, and uh, Gamble Township. Um, again, kind of a highland country sort of site. Uh, Mifflin Township, Zinc Road, this is not too far north of uh, 220 and, and east of 287. A uh, pretty level uh, ground area. Um, so the low profile is ideal for a case like Mifflin. Uh, next slide is uh, Low Hill Road, Penn Township. Now, Low Hill uh, drains, there's this uh, very large swamp uh, just west of North Mountain, and um, the stream comes through here at very low velocity. The, the entire, whatever flood happens, it floods the swamp out, and then what comes out of here is kind of control, controlled flow. There's not a lot of velocity. Park Road in Montgomery Borough, that's the park where the ball field is and the boat ramp is, um, just, to, just alongside where 405 crosses the river. And so this is dead level. Uh, there's no velocity here because downstream of this structure, there's a concrete uh, box culvert runs under Route 405, and right. that's undersized. Is that the one they recently closed? That just closed that, yes. Yeah. Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. That one was interesting. They um, took T-beams like you use for parking decks, and they set them on top of 55-gallon uh, drums filled with concrete. And then they were there was concrete foundation under that, and that was fine for a park road for getting to a ball field, but it, it just didn't hold up, and that's that's the issue why it's closed. Yeah. And the last one is Penn Drive in Wolf Township. Uh, we're going to be at more than doubling the opening. This bridge bridge was one of the most dramatically undersized. Couldn't even pass a ten year flood, and you see the abutments are literally neck down to the bridge itself. So a much longer bridge. Um, Interestingly enough, the stream velocities here meet the PennDOT criteria, which is less than 12 feet per second during a flood, which allows us to put the GRS bridge together. On the right-hand side is more photos of a GRS abutment. This is the one for the pedestrian bridge on the top. And you can see where it's, it's a concrete block around the geotextile abutment and then the ramp to it. This construction photo. And the bottom photo is what an adjacent beam uh, box beam bridge looks like. The beams literally sit, sit right next to each other and um, 
That way we don't have steel pan forms in between the beams. It uh, saves about a week during construction and pouring the deck. We literally just set the reinforcing on top here, set up the side forms you pour the deck. So uh, it really is critical for saving time. Next, do you want to talk about number four? Yeah, we'll just do it before. Okay. okay. <coughs> so, bundle four uh, we'll be doing next year. Um, Bass Engineering is doing the design for that this year. Uh, there will be a bridge replacement, a beam over bridge, and a bridge repair. Um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue to see the cost savings that we've seen with one. We're hoping to see with three. Um, Matt, if you want to go to the next slides, we'll just go through the picture. So Upper Bodine's Road, a road in Lewis Township. Um, uh, next slide, Washington Township, Gap Road. And uh, the final one is Old Cement Road in Fairfield Township. So um, those will be next year. Uh, Matt, if you want to go to the final slide. So those will be next year. So all told, we'll have done 17 bridges in three years, which is a full calendar year ahead of uh, what our anticipation was. Um, like we said before, you know, this is the first uh, county spot or county run municipal muni municipally owned uh, bridge bundling program in the state of Pennsylvania. So, you know, we're we're extremely fortunate that we're out ahead of the curve here. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be working on this project. We have a great team with our municipalities, with our state uh, agencies, with the county commissioners. Um, and you know, I think you know. Obviously, hindsight is always twenty twenty. But I, I feel that years down the road from now, we're going to be uh, seen in a, in a very uh, good light. You know, across the state, that we were able to get out ahead of you know municipal owned infrastructure. Um, you know, because as we've seen in Pittsburgh and stuff like that, you 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 want to be out ahead of this. And we'd much rather be doing press conferences, doing ribbon cuttings, than you know for some sort of tragedy that has happened, unfortunately. So. Um, it's a big year for the county as far as bridge replacements go, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. I don't know if you have any closing oh, remarks, Bruce. Oh, oh, yeah. Austin, I have a question. Has sure. Armstrong Township reached out to you for bridge? So uh, four? the rest of the team is actually upstairs uh, with them in PennDOT right now, so okay. um, they're they're communicating on that. Um, we're uh, hopeful we can you know see some cost savings, get them in on four, but. Uh, we're working other avenues just in case because we know that there is a severe need there to get that bridge done. So we're already trying to find, you know, plan B and plan C to uh, be proactive in that regard. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Austin, I yeah. want to try to put this in perspective for our constituents. We started collecting the $5 fee per car in what year? Uh, 2019, I think. It was yeah, was 19, it 19? 19. Okay. And then under our PIV loan that we have, mm -hmm. We're going to collect the five dollar fee to pay off that loan until what year? Uh, Twenty. Try, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Ten yeah, years. Ten years. Ten, it's ten years. Yeah. Ten years. Well, but we may. Will we have enough revenue to pay it off in the ten years, or will we have to collect a year? Um. Like we I'd, were, have, I'd have to look at it, Commissioner. All right. Sorry. Let's say for the yeah. sake of argument that it's that it's twelve years, right? So you're talk or twenty. You're talking about twelve dollars. Twelve times five dollars. Mm -hmm. Sixty or seventy-five dollars per car that people pay, uh, put in to, to uh, per re you know per person has one vehicle. I mean that's unbelievable, right? To fix seventeen bridges plus we got the two extra bonus bridges that were uh, you know close to two million dollars. But I mean think about the alternative of raising property taxes or whatever. It's it, now part of that the public should understand is because we're collecting that fee from entities that typically don't pay property taxes. You know, uh, large organizations that are nonprofit or that are not subject to property tax, and they have fleets of vehicles and they pay it and they drive they drive on the roads and they should pay it. So, but that that's really, I think, quite quite good for, for the public and, and obviously for the safety when you say these bridges are 100 years old. So hats off to uh, all of you. Yeah. We compared this to the uh, broadband conversation yesterday that you know every county is a little bit different unique and uh, we have counties with similar uh, geography and uh, mountain areas mountainous areas so uh, when we were looking at trying to attack the broadband you know if the counties got together used the same consultant same engineer you know uh, 
we could probably save some money there, as well as the fact that we don't know exactly how much the state and federal government are going to give us. Mm -hmm. So why use our precious resources when there may be programs or grants out there uh, in the future? Uh, I do want to say this. As far as a bridge bundling, what's most important is that 100 percent, 100 percent of the money collected goes out to the bridges. Yep. Right. You know, there's there's no administrative fees, uh, even though there's a lot of work there. You've put a lot of work in it. Uh, we don't take any of that money for your fees. We already charge the taxpayers for it. So, and uh, you've done a you've done a great job for us. You know, so hats off to Bassett. Yep, thank you to every mm -hmm. each partner and everybody's working on these. And and hats off to Mark Morawski who yeah. brought the program to the last board of commissioners. Uh, and, and for his following it, and he had been a long-term employee of the county, and, uh, uh, you know, quite honestly, I'm not sure that, and that's what staff are paid to do, is to bring ideas to the commissioners, and then, of course, the commissioners have to take uh, the responsibility to try to implement it. But, Commissioner Messier, in terms of that discussion about the broadband, it occurred to me during that conference yesterday that uh, it would be nice if the state put into effect some sort of $5 fee on existing, uh, I know the public's going to go nuts on this, but some way to collect a fee that, you know, if it were $5 a household or something that could allow us to build out the areas that are not built out. Because if you're in an area that's got high density, you're getting really good high-speed internet. In some cases, you're getting uh, fiber optic whereas the rest of your neighbors are struggling for their kids to go to school for you know when they have to work at home or whatever so but anyway that's another discussion everybody has one of these yes it, it's part of the fee part of the fee five dollars of the fee that's charged for these will go to broadband probably solve this problem yeah i think it would be good for austin to point out our bridge inspection program which feeds us these bridges Yes. <clears throat> so that was that was part of the you know the thought process in, in formulating this whole program was, um, you know, we had a small bridge inspection program. There are bridges under 20 feet, but over 8 feet, that by state reg regulations are not required to be inspected, but should be because you know, bridge is a bridge, and you know you want to know that what you're driving over is safe to drive over. So. Um, Bassett and his team did that up until was it 2016? 2016. 2016. Um, and uh, when that went away, you know, we realized that um, there, was, there was a significant number of bridges that, you know, we weren't expecting inspecting them, but we knew that they were going to continue to deteriorate um, at, you know, an uneven amount. You know, it's not like it's a linear thing, you know, because one flood can significantly impact the bridge. So um, that program itself, which we've since brought back, um, and restarted uh, this past year, old 2021. Um, that's back in the process of, of inspecting these bridges. And you know, we had a couple bridges um, that were uh, in the first year of inspection that were actually you know beyond the point of being able to be operable and had to be closed because they had just degraded that far. So those bridges are you know being worked on um, or, or have since been closed. But um, you know, we're fortunate that we've been proactive. Uh, as far as you know, bridge infrastructure, road infrastructure um, throughout the county. And Britt, you bring up a good point that a lot of these bridges have not been looked at for years because of the how are we going to fund it? And for a township or a borough to be able to pay only five percent of the overall bill, where they can afford that, that's the route to go. The, you know, after we did started the inspections in 2010. The only townships that were doing bridges were ones that were getting substantial amounts of Act 13 funding, and that's only a part of the township that gets them. Like Penn Township, for example, they were one of the first being drilled, and we did four bridges for them as a bridge early bridge bundle program. And Pine Township and some of the others that got Act 13 money were able to do that, a lot of them could not. So this is really critical, and you know, it really is something to say you know five dollars per vehicle, even if you have a few vehicles. You know, twenty dollars a year for four vehicles is is minimal, and yet it, it pushed all these municipalities over that point to where yeah we can afford to place bridges. Oh. Absolutely. And these township supervisors have very difficult jobs with limited budgets. I'm sure it's been very frustrating for them for for years, and now for the price of a pizza, right? Many yeah. of these many of these homes, 
You're having your bridges fixed. Typical bridge project for a rural township costs, you know, half to one full annual year budget. And they had to borrow the money, and then politically, that's very difficult to borrow money to just replace a bridge. So it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. That's 5% uh, yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. And I can afford that. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Five point one, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, JPO is asking that you approve an amendment to our current agreement to add a residential program at Chor Youth and Family Services. It's a boys' residential, and the cost per day is four hundred dollars. Okay. Any questions? It's a new program they added. So we do you have get it in there? I was going to say, do you have someone you think you're you're going to? We have someone in there right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 400 a day actually seems a little lower than some of the other ones that we've seen at 500 and yeah I mean it's still a lot of it's money going to be about the average anymore. is it going to be the average okay. <laughs> unfortunately you, you know off the top of your head how many children we have in placement right now in different agencies across this, and do we have any out in Ohio right now I knew we did Ohio I I don't think anybody's out in Ohio right now do you know about the other ones that know it's a it's a question that you weren't prepared for, but I didn't know you had the answer. I don't. I don't think we have anybody in. Like, you mean like the detention centers? Yeah. I don't think we have anybody in there right now. Okay. You know, now that you're talking about that, you know, we lost uh, Judge McCoy to uh, Little League over mm -hmm. there, and um, I believe a senior judge is taking over that department. Judge Anderson. Judge Anderson. Are, are you seeing any backlogs or any concerns regarding placements? I'm not at that end of it. You're not it. at that end of okay. Yes, I don't know. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, Dave could probably tell you. Okay, we'll but I, where I'm at with it, I'm, I don't see it. Right. I don't okay, know. thanks. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Do you have a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any further questions or discussion for Nancy? Yeah. Well, Aye. 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 So Thank curious. you. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, how long have you been doing this? JPL, uh, 10 years. You, you're, you're doing a great job. She's our great negotiator. <laughs> yeah. That's why I like well, she really, she, she, she doesn't sell for just a price. She talks to them, tries to get them to come down, and you're often successful. Often, and, and but on um, behalf of the taxpayers, they appreciate. Bear with that. me this year; it may I may not be as fruitful. <laughs> well, I'm already having trouble. It, it's tough uh, everywhere. <laughs> it's tough everywhere to try to get prices down anywhere because yeah. it's it's the world we live in right now. I'm having one right now that they, I can't get them down, and I'm trying to lock them in yeah. in two years at least, and yeah. Yeah, I'm getting stone balled. Yeah. <laughs> well, and in, and in fairness, to understand that you know, if you follow what's going on, the uh, the PPNL has gone in for an increase at the PUC, uh, yeah, by they, oh, almost ten percent. Uh, tough job. Yeah, UGI I think has put into yeah. effect a. Uh, I thought I read the documents that said it was almost like a thirty percent increase, um, but I don't want to be quoted on that. But it's an increase. Still all all the utilities are increasing. Yeah. Your utility bills, you see it. Yeah. So they these places have to provide all the utilities yep. and, and their the trained food. staff, your and tax and bill. especially with right. the detention yeah. centers and stuff. You have to have, you know, specialty trained staff, and right. it all it all adds up in the long run. It does. And obviously, the county does everything it can to try to avoid putting a child in placement, right? Correct. But at a certain point, yeah. if it's if there's option. it's the last option. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. <laughs> Jason, are you on the line? Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jason. Uh, Commissioners, item 5.2. This is a request for approval of a new John Deere mower that we use here on site for all the slope work. It costs $38,250.85 for replacement. 2010 has almost 3,500 hours on it. This is part of the 2022 capital budget, and this is through the purchase through CoStars. Okay, 
Jason, how many acres do you mow over there? Uh, a lot of them. A lot. Yeah, a lot of them. You, you know, Commissioner, I, I deserve that because you asked me that question one other time and I did not get back to you with the answer. I apologize. I would say it's, it's well in excess of 100 plus. Yeah, I want the public to understand that when we're going out to buy a mower for 38000 to replace one that's 22 years old, we're trying to mow uh, 100 acres. We're not mowing... Uh, you know, even three or four acres. Plus, we know the funds are coming out of the landfill revenue. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I just leaned over and said, I'm gonna ask you if you have any comments, and I asked him if he would say that, and once again, you jumped the gun. <laughs> you won't let him say it for one week. That's okay, Commissioner. He can say it on the next one. <laughs> okay. All right, can I have a motion? We have a motion? Yeah, I, I move to approve. I'll second. I'll finish that. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Fishers, next agenda item 5.3. This is an amendment to the agreement that we have with Cleveland Brothers, our, one of the, well, that's our CAP uh, heavy equipment provider that we usually buy through. They also have an agreement with us for service on an as needed basis. As you see, the agreement was signed in January of 2017, it expires in 2026. Each year, if they come out with an amendment and increase in prices, we have to make the amendment. And as you can see, the increases average between five to seven percent increases across the board between shop labor, field labor, travel, overtime, the works. So we we have them on standby as an ad, as needed basis. If, if they have to jump on a piece of machinery and fix it while we're on something else, but um, yeah, nothing's going down. Okay, have a motion. I move to approve. I'll second. Do you have any comments, Commissioner Sarr? Yeah, Jason, do you ever uh, ask for taxpayers' money to pay for anything over that landfill? No, sir. We do not use taxpayer funds. Okay, very good. It's a different twist. It's a know? different twist. But I, I will say this. Um, I mean, you take a look at the look at the gasoline and how much that's gone up in the past two weeks. Um, just the cost of goods and services. I know in my business, over the last three months, our rates have gone. What we are being charged for our goods have gone up over 30%. And uh, we had this discussion with the landfill yesterday uh, that you know we have to uh, pay particular attention to your margins now uh, and, and how it will evaporate quickly. So um, all options uh, are available to us. And so we have to you know, pay attention to that. And I, I know we can spread it out over a number of customers, but uh, we want to make sure that our profit margin doesn't go down to uh, critical levels. Because your, your business, is, it, it's needed. And, and those costs, when you're talking about going up 7%, it's on a half a million, million, or $2 million pieces of equipment. That's, that's a substantial amount of money, yeah. and I know our ch our pay hasn't gone up to meet the the inflation right now. So, and just to follow up on the comment that Commissioner Bassner made um, when he asked if you use any taxpayer money, you even pay back in addition to the money that you give the county, you pay back for the use of county departments through your cost. Uh, allocation. 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 So if you're using the HR, right? If you're yeah, using any other department that service or works with RMS, we pay for their hourly rates, and then we, of course, cover all of our own expenses with our own employees, retirement, fringe, indirect, um, all that. Yeah, that's important for the taxpayers to understand. That the landfill is an important asset for us to to keep our taxes down. For self sufficient. Right. And we are. I guess this use this as a plug. Is we are we always have openings. Uh, we are looking for equipment operators, drivers, stuff like that. It is it is increasingly difficult as these costs go up on our employees and on prospective employees to be competitive. And James, Jason, uh, Jessica is going to be having a job fair for county uh, positions in the near future. I'm sure she's going to be having you there to explain the positions open at the landfill and the career opportunities that are available uh, for, for the public. Yeah, maybe you can shoot her an email just to make sure you get on the list in case you're... Oh, yeah. Well, we've already had that discussion. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. 
Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Petitioner in five four is a request for a 2022 Cleveland Mobile Screen Plan. Cost is 298,761 dollars This replaces a 2009 screen machine that we have. This was a one of the larger pieces we brought to your attention last year in capital budget for 2022. This will be one of the key pieces along with some other equipment back there at the back farm utilized to screen the soil and help remove the cube, all the cubic yards, million cubic yards of soil we had to get off that back piece so that it's prepped. We do need the dirt and this is a machine that will help screen the soil for us. And this is a 2022 budget item and it is uh, through the purchase of customers. Okay, the motion. I move to approve. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Okay, lastly, commissioners, item 5.5. This is a permit. Let me find the paper here. I lost the paper. This is the permit application to be, be for the permit modification, I should say. So the permit that we each a tank under is going to get modified because we're going to put a tertiary liner. And we're going to also remove the steps that are currently in order to make big design changes of that such we have to have a permit modification through the Department of Environmental Protection before we can Okay. Uh, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll uh, second. All in favor say aye. 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 So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, comment. Comments? Yeah, I'd, I'd uh, like to make a comment. You know, uh, there are a number of people that read what happened in the paper the other day, yesterday, and um, uh, the, the county is well prepared. Law enforcement, they're, they're incredible. Uh, from the 911 service to, you know, uh, the law enforcement. Uh, precautions that they take uh, it's, it's just it's an enormous task when you when you ask a, a law enforcement to get involved and it's one that I, I I realize that more now than ever that they're jeopardizing their lives for a phone call that comes into them uh, to help out so uh, my hats go off to them I really appreciate that uh, but it's also um, it's also, uh, we go through a lot of training, uh, and we have a program called the CIT, uh, Critical Intervention Teams. Uh, and they, this team is set up to uh, identify people with mental health issues um, and try to avoid them going into incarceration. Uh, and, and being able to identify that is, is critical. Uh, no one gets any help for the most part. Well, our prison is a little bit different. We do try to send out some counselors there, but nobody gets any, any help in prison when they have some serious mental health issues. And a, a mental health issue could be lifelong, or it could be one day. It just depends on the circumstances. And um, I applaud uh, you know the people that get involved in that to I to to realize it. Hey, if they can sleep it off, they can do whatever they need to do or get the help necessary. Uh, it is critical uh, for the recovery of those people. So, uh, without saying too much, I appreciate everything that that uh, everyone did and uh, recognizing what what happened. So. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday I was on a CCAP call with probably about 100 commissioners across the state on the issue of broadband. And, um, you know, we've talked about the need to have broadband for people who work from home, high-speed internet. Uh, in many of our communities outside uh, Williamsport, they're using dial-up or they're using uh, pretty slow uh, speeds. And we've always thought about it in terms of attracting people here and bringing people here. And yesterday, very interesting comment by Commissioner Mark Higgins up in Center County, and he said, 
and I had I had been talking about the fact that we're trying to repopulate the commissioners are working on trying to get people to come to the county because we've lost population he made a very good point he said you know what for folks he said under 40 and he may be right but for people under 40 if they don't have access to high-speed internet many of them will eventually leave the area and I thought that that was actually a perspective that I had not looked at looking at it from the other direction we're always focused on trying to get them here and not thinking about people who may be leaving certainly people under 30 they're gonna leave because they grew up in a environment in which it was as much a part of their existence as electricity is for those of us who grew up post 1938 when electricity finally came across all of America right so if we were born in the 50s we just hey you turn the light on right um, and it's something that that we really need to grapple with and and I know my colleagues feel the same way and we've had many conversations about it and uh, I think with the American Rescue Plan funds and some other ideas that maybe we try to implement we, we have to find a way to get this county um, built out, especially when you, when you think, you know, yesterday we had a meeting and if you look in the paper, Intel is investing about at least $25 billion in Columbus, Ohio to build facilities that will manufacture chips. Columbus, Ohio is just under 400 miles from here. I was looking at it on the map. And we could end up seeing a migration of people looking for jobs out there and of course we want that here because we need to bring people here for our existing employers plus the jobs that have been created and will be created so it's a challenge for us um, part of what we I said on the call to CCAP is that we need help from CCAP and we need help from the state uh, the state has set up a, a broadband authority which they were required to do under the uh, uh, the uh, federal legislation that sends probably about over a hundred million dollars to our state for uh, broadband uh, development so anyway for those of you out there if you've got thoughts or ideas on it let us know uh, but it is something that we realize has to be has to be tackled just like the bridges had to be uh, built and repaired we need to find a way to build this broadband out uh, last week we uh, we voted and approved uh, some funding to be given to the um, northern part of our county for municipalities uh, regarding their fire and any EMS services and um, the the fire the volunteer fire companies are, are very very dear to my heart I know they are to the air commissioners too um, there has been many times the commissioners have assisted these fire companies they have been crushed through COVID crushed uh, these are their fire companies that have fundraisers on a regular basis to try to maintain their departments They've gone from 300,000 members statewide in 1980 to down to 30,000 statewide now. We are very blessed to have them in our communities. Very few people have the DNA to use their own funds to um, go out and, and leave their families on weekends, holidays, uh, in the middle of the night to go assist their fellow man and to make sure that they get us the services to the hospital or fight fight the fires that they have to fight it, they're special special people um, the reason why we went into that agreement was we knew they needed assistance um, the townships put skin in the game their own um, township supervisors took parts of their budget and threw money into it to make it a regionalization approach. Uh, we encourage other municipalities to do the same. We want to help everybody, but we can't help everybody. We can't help every individual need that comes to our office. But we can sit down and have a dialogue and try to figure out how we can solve the problem. And solving the problem is through regionalization, through working together and having that dialogue so we can try to assist as many as possible. Uh, I'll continue to, uh, to stop at the chicken barbecues. And, and any chance I get to help a volunteer fire company, I'm gonna be there to try to help them. Uh, because they're, they are special people. We appreciate what they do. Um, but when it comes to the funding overall, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough challenge. 
and uh, we agreed to do this because of the the fact that the townships themselves uh, stepped up to the plate threw money in um, they realized they had a problem to tackle they talked about it for you heard the chiefs last year they've been talking about this for 20 years and they were finally able to come together and do so and um, and that's what we need to do we need to have those conversations so that we can try to solve the problem because it is a huge problem and uh, we're on the same page everybody's on the same page it's to get the public the assistance we can't be uh, uh, disgruntled to each other we have to work together as a team to solve the problem so we're going to be having conversations with them that we've had two of them reach out to us we look forward to setting up a meeting with them and seeing what we can do um, from a regional approach and see how we can assist them um, because it is needed um, we, we thank them over and over for their service and uh, we'll continue to try to assist them. Could, could I add one more thing? Yes. Uh, to piggyback off of Commissioner Marabito's comments uh, and I think this is very uh, important because we're about ready to make some decisions on the AARP money you know that's the 22 million dollars that the county is going to be or is receiving and uh, we're meeting with a, a number of different uh, organizations uh, from sewer and water to um, uh, our developers and nonprofits and, and whatnot and we've had some very good conversations um, and you and you wonder where should government step in um, and help or assist and uh, we have some projects coming up especially in the sewer and water and and development stages we we need housing to to attract more people and so should we invest some of that money into incentives for developers to to buy or build should we uh, assist in uh, sewer and water authorities to give them some funds to get those lines out to those developments and or should we identify the areas that could be potentially uh, possible to build and develop that already has the existing infrastructure. So there are a lot of a lot of issues that we're going to have to take into consideration. And uh, I love the public to, to give us some input as well. And and maybe the the paper can can help us out there. Uh, but this is just a a development. And so there's probably 22 lots on this development. And some people say don't help. But one of our, you know, everybody, when you're running for office, will say, what's the first thing they say? I'm going to lower your taxes, right? Well, that's nice, but uh, I've not seen any taxes being lowered. And stabilizing the tax base is very critical. And so I don't look at this, and, and Matt, you have a tagline on yours, we don't spend money, we invest it, right? But I look at this as revenue. Anything that's new, okay, it's going to be taxed. And if we're responsible, we will, you know, keep the taxes level. Or it could be possible that we would be able to lower, but that's our number one priority. We, we have to try to balance out the taxation and uh, make it affordable for the people that live here. So should we invest in, in these uh, developments or these plans or these authorities? Uh, and how do we? Because um, I, I look at this and say, well, geez, you could probably get a thousand to, you'd have twenty, thirty thousand dollars You actually have 72 on that. You said 22. 72. Well, this was just an example. Yeah. Okay, I don't know, even know what this one is. But you, if, if we can grow, just like the city of Williamsport, if, if we invested the $49,000 a piece, we'd get a return on taxation in a year and a half. They would get it in three quarters of a year. You know, so is that responsible? Is this how you should move forward in the future? I, I don't know, but I, I'd be curious to hear uh, uh, some other uh, opinions. We've had, we've had three uh, meetings with the uh, water and sewer and the developers and realtors. 
and what we've been told is uh, there's the immediate needs here. We've gone from 600 homes on the average on the market per year. Uh, right now it's under uh, 175. So it's, it's, it's less than 33%. And uh, that's why you see a, uh, a shortage of housing in the area. Um, they said there's homes available, they can sell them. And um, the need is not five years from now, it's now. They, they want the homes built now. So you look at, okay, what what is out there that has the water and sewer? Because it's not profitable for a developer to come in and do the water and sewer and then do the housing. There's, there's no margin left for them. So if the water and sewer is already in place, they come in with the development and uh, they can develop the homes that, that we desperately need in the area right now. And that's what we're hearing. You know, Matt just made a good comment here. Go ahead, Matt. I was going to say maybe uh, we should hold a town hall with to get public input, and we could set that up. It's a good idea. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. In fact, yeah. I think the, I don't know if the city did it, but yeah, no, we should. The city had a thing online. So. Online, yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt you. Will you? No. Okay, so, you know, the, the, the things that the three of us are talking about is that we hear from our employers they can't find people to work. We know that we have 50 openings at the county. Um, we, we talked about population repopulation, but also population retention. And so I think it's important for the public to recognize that there may be things done that are changes right there are changes sometimes change can be kind of scary for people right but we recognize and our constituents are telling us that if we don't do something uh, at a certain point we're just going to continue to shrink and shrink in population and eventually you'll see services closing uh, you know look we've already seen businesses closing in terms of our retail shopping right I mean Macy's didn't close because they were having too much business Macy's closed because they probably couldn't do enough business. Um, I don't know about Best Buy, but I, I can guarantee you that that was the case with Macy's uh, because uh, sometimes when you walk through the store, it was empty, it's literally empty, and they're paying all that heat and everything. So what I think we hopefully can look at is an overall comprehensive approach that is conducive to population growth and population retention, including building new housing because some people come to our community to work and they don't want a house that's 75 years old. Or they're living in Lewisburg. Or they're living in Lewisburg. They're commuting from Lewisburg. That's a good point because there's new houses. So so what the commissioner is talking about is trying to assist the uh, development of the infrastructure. Early learning, when, when people are looking at our community from afar and they are saying, okay, my, my partner's gonna work, I'm gonna work, who's going to watch our children, or we want to have children. Where are our children going to go, because we also want to have a career. Uh, broadband we talked about. Parks and recreation. You know, people, it's a quality of life. People want to move into a community where they know that they have places to take their children to libraries, parks, recreation. What's interesting is all of the categories in the American Rescue Plan funds hit, especially communities like ours that are struggling hit with funds to help us improve the quality of life and do what we need to do for population retention and repopulation. So it's an exciting time for us to be commissioners because we have an opportunity to do something uh, that will last beyond uh, our term here. Yeah, we, we often said that we need to make sure that the way we spend these monies are generation. That's the key. It's, it's something that's going to last for generations to come. I agree totally with Commissioner Sark. I said when I ran, we need to grow the tax base. And the way you grow the tax base is new construction. New homes, and that's how you grow the tax base. And uh, and I think it's one way we have to approach this. And, and part of what's really great about what's happened with the American Rescue Plan is for those projects on new homes that were on the margin, somebody didn't really want to build them because it was questionable whether they were going to really be able to get the rate of return or any return, helping out on water and sewer infrastructure gives that little extra push that can push a project over the line. And as you said, it creates a new taxable parcel that was before vacant land, taxed at a very low rate, creates a taxable parcel that then will ease the taxes on, on other people. 
So that, that's our challenge, and it's not just a challenge for the three of us, it's a challenge for everyone in this community uh, to come up and step up and, and uh, share their ideas. You know, on the last thing you said, Commissioner uh, Metzger, about the fire companies, one thing we can do, even if we can't volunteer, we can obviously buy the chicken. If your volunteer fire company has members, you can become a member. You don't necessarily have to go out to every fire or even go. You can, but you can pay the 50, 60, or $75 that helps them, yep. right? And so I think if, if you're living in a community that's dependent on a volunteer fire company, you ought to call them up and say, hey, do you have a membership plan? Can I, can I plan? You know, we, we, our family is members of that Burns volunteer fire company. Because during COVID, they were not eligible for lost revenues. Right. They were one of the nonprofits that were excluded from it, which my view is wrong, but they, they weren't able to receive the monies. And um, so this is so, so important that whatever way we can assist them, and just have that dialogue to try to, to uh, do something. About whatever one, small way you can. About one in five households that may be high give a time contribution to a local volunteer fire company. Yep. If, if the municipality has to staff a fire company with 10 personnel, you need 10 personnel minimum. We're talking about 24 7 protection, 260 hours a week. It'd be about a million dollars. Yeah. And they're not getting paid. I mean, the point is that they, they, they have to have equipment, they have to have training. So if you can do that in your part, you know, think about that. You, you, you probably spend at least 100 bucks a month on your cable television. So to spend $75 a year helping your volunteer fire company is really something that yeah. is, is easy to do. I think, uh, gentlemen, if, if you would take the time to, to read Senate Resolution, I think it's Senate, Senate Resolution 6, was up, Rick, you were out of, I don't think you were, uh, you were a representative yeah, I think you were gone. About 2017, uh, there was a bipartisan group, and it was truly bipartisan. It was both sides of the aisle. It was these and ours that make a difference. Uh, it was bringing fire rescue, EMS, government together with legislators. Uh, they did an incredible study, about a two-year study. That if, you, if you read that study, you'll be scared. It sits. Very little was done with it. Very little was done. They made tremendous recommendations to the legislature. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, as a 45-year volunteer fireman, one of those guys that went out every single night, every single day of my life, um, big government's not helped us. You know, the example I use is you talk about the chicken barbecue, Scott, and, and, and the fact that we have to maintain our facilities. You know, every volunteer fire company in this county goes to every wire down, every gas leak, every tree down, every pole shared, every utility emergency, who goes first? volunteer fire company. And what do they get in return? The utility bill. Every single month from every single utility. What do you think the liability protection is that a fire company provides when a wire comes down? Just turn on 220 outside of Picture Rocks, 5 o'clock yesterday morning. Tractor trailer on its side, shared a pole, driver trapped in the truck, PPNL was given a critical call to respond, fire chief and crews protected that seat from anybody being electrocuted and saved that man. What do you think the liability protection was for PPNL? Tremendous. Right. What do they get for it? A utility bill. And that's, they aren't small utility bills for fire yeah. stations. No, that's a good point, Sheriff. Um, actually, maybe we need to run some legislation in Harrisburg that at least says to the utilities, listen, when a call is made out on one of your wires, you're going to contribute X amount to a fund that goes to volunteer fire companies or whatever. You know, and, and I don't know, I don't think they do they that should. now. They should because when you read your PPL bill, who do they tell you to call when there's an emergency? Right. When there's a gas leak, who gets called? The county 911 center gets yeah. called. They send the fire department. Yeah. It's a slippery snow. But uh, well, again, again, people yeah. love to eat, so they're there. there listen, there has to be a change. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, you all and I won't be in office when 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 true ground zero strikes. Yeah. But when you go from 300,000 to about, it's actually about 37,000, it's going to get to the point where there will be nobody to respond. Right. You look at the you look at the dispatches now that take three, four, five stations to manage a typical house fire. When I was a young firefighter, one station would handle that. Not anymore. We talked about this. We attended the Oli Coming Fire um, Awards ceremony here a couple Saturdays ago, and uh, they talked about the Sweeley a Avenue accident back in the 70s, and there was 45 members just that evening that responded. Today, that would be four or five companies to be responding. There's no question. There's no question. Yeah. As, 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 an EMT, as, a, as an EMT chief for 25 years at Oli Cumming, 
My high EMT number under my command were 25 EMTs. You're lucky to find two or three EMTs in a, in a fire department. There was a gentleman that's still with us who drove the ambulance that night, and he had the flu. He had the full-fledged flu. Got out of bed to drive the ambulance that, that day. Um, you know, the dedication, the dedication that we it's hear. It's much different today, and, and yeah. we, it's just it's business as usual. There just isn't a whole lot of changes come to the fire service. An ambulance. When I built my first ambulance uh, on paper, fifty thousand dollars. Two fifty today. An engine was uh, seventy thousand dollars. It's five hundred thousand dollars today. An aerial was one hundred, two hundred thousand dollars then. A million dollars today. Spaghetti suppers don't pay those bills. No, yeah. but we all like to eat, and uh, you'll see the dinners <laughs> go on. Whole like coming. Second has, time you said that. Oh, yep. <laughs> that's what I, told you. I think you like dessert. I do. For the next, I think, seven weeks in a row, we have Old Light coming and having her fish fry on Friday night. Oh, yeah. So it's a delicious... Yeah, throw kudos to uh, Huzo. Yep. Uh, I spoke to Huzo has theirs. They're start to do fish fries. Yep. So please, if you drive by and you see their stop in and, uh, and support them because uh, we all need them and we thank them. Yep. You know, we also have been blessed with Act 13 money that uh, is specifically there's category to help our, our fire and uh, volunteer fire company. So... Uh, we we have we have some options. So, when you see us, uh, you know, give out an award to a fire company. Um, remember this last hundred thousand. Two things there that were very different than others. Three municipalities each put in money. How many? Four. Four. Four municipalities. Thank you, Commissioner. Four municipalities put in money each, and the fire companies came together to share resources. And so. We know that many of the fire companies are doing that now and they've approached us. We're going to have meetings. We're going to talk to them. We're going to try to hopefully get support from the municipalities too. By state law, the municipalities are responsible for providing the service in the community. So I think what the sheriff is talking about and what we have to remember is just because we don't fund something doesn't mean the problem goes away, right? I mean, in other words, you're down to 30,000. If you get to the point where there are no volunteers, you're still going to have fires. You're still going to have electrical lines go down. And at that point, municipalities may be forced to actually institute higher taxes to, to pay for it. So we're hoping to, force, to, to avoid all that by doing something uh, and supporting the groups who are doing it on their own, that group uh, from the Northern Alliance. And Eastern Light Coming, we know Clinton Township Fire Company has responded. We have Mr. Larry Stout in the back, former supervisor. Uh, has responded to fires uh, all over. So we'll, we'll get there. We're working together to get there. Okay, do we need public comment? Mr. Stell. <clears throat> yes, Larry Stell from Clinton Township. Um, first off, I know you're apologizing for only a one page, <laughs> but you didn't have to attach a second blank. That was not necessary. But uh, okay. anyway, that was my late amusement um, I, I can't affirm enough what you said about a volunteer fire company and I and I'm a living example anybody can do it because I mean I joined in my 60s and uh, it's 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 um, any everybody can do something mm -hmm. so I, I really want to encourage anyone that's hearing us just please any way you can help because days gonna come when you dial 911 911 nobody answers I mean so to speak. I mean, it's it, we take it for granted. These are people that, that uh, I can't say enough about them. But I just wanted to make a public service announcement you mentioned in your, your prayers about Ukraine. I just, I'm very, I have, um, I'm, a, I'm actually uh, an MBA, um, part of a global MBA program to which uh, I've traveled considerably uh, around the country, uh, around the world, and Ukraine was one of them. I have a lot of friends there. I hear I'm hearing from them all the time, and they are actually uh, extremely blessed that America cares about what's going on there. They are they are uh, really uh, encouraged. To be quite honest, they don't know anything more about what's going on than we do. Uh, this one particular, I can't mention names or where he's from, but um, he mentions the, for example, he said the the city of Kharkov, which is one of probably the most Russian-speaking uh, Russian. Uh, supporting uh, city in Ukraine and today it's rubble it's ruined and they don't understand why why should we be destroyed they they there's just an enormous amount of uh, confusion and even 
the the claims that Russians have apparently that they have occupied certain areas. What they occupy are the roads, because the people are not getting out of their homes. They are granted there's a lot of them, you know, people leaving, but um, the particular right in this particular city, I can't, I don't want to mention, but uh, he said that they are all sitting on sandbags and Molotov cocktails. You know, they're just like, go ahead, come on, and uh, there's just an enormous amount of um, um, what do you want to say pushing back on this um, and they like I said I, I also greatly uh, am concerned quite frankly for also the Russians because I have I even have a Russian daughter adopted daughter so I mean I, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic towards their cause and from what I'm hearing from that side they don't understand either what this is all about no one seems to understand why are we even doing this and that's on both sides of the of the border so even the Russians themselves um, are quite uh, concerned. So it's a, uh, it's trying times. It, it's um, difficult even to know. Uh, but I would, I would very much distrust almost anything you're hearing these days because in the fog of war, you get a lot of different opinions. And even what I'm giving you is secondhand. I mean, this is just from one, uh, one primary source. I've heard from others. But uh, the one thing I think is true is that uh, they really do appreciate Americans. Uh, who do have a tendency to be preoccupied with our own needs. And, um, you know, as they say, you can tell an American, you just can't tell them much. And that's sort of unfortunate that, uh, in fact, one Brit told me this, you Americans think you own the world and let the rest of us live on a part of it. And I said, I know that seems to be true, but there's a few of us that really do care about the rest of the world. And I think at this time, just your prayers and all the things that concern, I think, mean a lot to them. So, thank you. Thank you, Larry. There was uh, some Russian soldiers that were captured yesterday on the news that uh, they were they were talking to their captors, and and the translation was they went to the border thinking they were doing military exercises, and as they crossed the border, they're like to their commanders, "What are we doing? Just move forward." And and they're complete um, in bewilderment. It was like, "What are we doing? Why are we captured? Why do we we were told to go there for exercises?" So I think even the soldiers from the military side, uh, on the Russian side, have been misled by their by their government, and uh, that's unfortunate because uh, there's endless lives being lost as a result of this this evil from one person. You know, Larry, um, you raise something which is interesting, which maybe hopefully can come out of this for us as Americans. I hope that in the future, when we are on the verge of invading or bombing a country like we did with Iraq, and even Afghanistan, that we'll look in the mirror for a minute and see the faces of Ukraine and say, wait a second, is this really what we should be doing? Um, I think that what we tend to forget, and what you just said when you said the city was in rubbles, is even today in Iraq, children are dying because the infrastructure that was destroyed 30 years ago has not been rebuilt. The water and sewer plants, and and that's that's and that's going to happen in Ukraine, right? It's going to take how long is it going to take to rebuild Ukraine, and even with the Western money, and uh, and then of course uh, just getting them out. So um, I'm not comparing the two. I'm just saying that it's an opportunity for us to reflect a minute uh, on it, and hopefully, uh, when we all have the rush to go to war. Because I, you know, the polls show that 50% of the top Russian population thinks that the U, well, they support, they support what's, well, who knows what the polls are, right? But, I would but the polls that, that right, the polls that are, con not, I think these polls were conducted by some yeah. uh, international base. They think they're justified to be there. That's my point, right? And that uh, we always think we're justified to do something that we do in the, in the name of, um, nationalism, patriotism, whatever it is. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't feel strong about our country or about our, you know, our beliefs, but that we should think twice before we uh, do it. I think that's maybe something I take from what you just told us. You know, so I appreciate that. We, we, we look, you know, everybody knows the joke about the guy in the flood and and I'm praying to God, you know, and, and I go up to the second floor and God hasn't arrived, but a boat did. He said, yeah. no, God will take care of me, and then finally dies and what happened, right? And you, you, you talk about the intervention. 
you know, we pray that, that he intervenes and they see the light or whatnot. And, and what is that intervention? And it, to me, right now, you know, I'm dead set against wars and things like that, but right now, after seeing that national pride, seeing what's happening and seeing how NATO and the, the, the rest of the world is saying, you know, this is wrong. Is it wrong for us just to sit back? You know, when do you intervene? When, when is enough is enough? It's very difficult, and we and we do have to pray. We have, you know, our hearts and souls because this is it's such a tragedy. Well, we were pulled into World War One. We were pulled into World War Two. Um, the, the sad thing is, we have a dictator who said that the day that the wall fell, he was in Germany, East Germany. It was the saddest day of his life and has stated in the 2007 summit that it is his legacy to restore the Soviet Union as it once was. Mm -hmm. So he is not going to stop at Ukraine. He is going to continue to go on and move on um, until until someone stops him because uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, he lied last week when he said he was just going to go into eastern Ukraine. Uh, he did the two treaties and, and you see what he's doing to the entire country. And uh, he's going to move past that, and uh, he's going to go after the Baltic states next. Uh, he's already threatened a nuclear war against Sweden and Finland if they uh, join NATO. And uh, so, how this affects us, it's going to pull our children into this war because uh, the more he advances, we won't be able to ignore it. We're not going to be able to sit back. We're, he's going to pull us into the war. So, it's already affecting us in our pocketbooks, it's going to affect us with our with our children next because we're going to have to go to war if this individual isn't stopped because he is not going to stop. He is a, he's a ruthless dictator who lies. We, we have reporters here that would like to go and <laughs> busy. So, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Larry, for your thank comments. You, thank you. Yeah. yeah, Larry, thanks. Anybody else from the public? Okay, hearing none, we are adjourned. One thing I do want to add, uh, last year we had uh, what the county does for you we had our departments come and, and speak to educate the uh, public on what our county offices did so starting in April what we're going to be doing is asking for nonprofits in the area we'll be reaching out to them and having the nonprofits come and explain what they do for the county as our guest we will give them five minutes to come and, and give a brief uh, description um, what they do for the residents of the county so look forward to that series starting in April in a town hall and we'll be scheduling a town hall on the Arbor Fund. Uh, so we'll be adjourned and we'll see you on March 10th is our next scheduled meeting, Thursday, March 10th, here in this meeting at 10 a.m. You know what? Maybe we can at some point even have our for profits come who, uh, sure. you know, who do things in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Take five minutes, what the heck? Yep. A chance Absolutely. Okay, thank you. <coughs> oh. I have five. We had heard that um, there was the scheduling of for the um, lawsuit that Mr. Rogers had filed. Well, it's a typical uh, 